In all of chapter 7, we're going to be do doing something called a substitution reaction. And so let's just take a second to organize our thoughts about what a substitution reaction is and how it can happen. Oftentimes you'll have something on a molecule that you just don't want, and you would love to replace it with something else that you do want. You could turn a toxic molecule into a medicinal molecule by replacing just one group on a carbon chain. So when you do that, when you take one group and you substitute it with another, that's what a substitution reaction is. Now, if you're trying to think in terms of arrow pushing patterns, the curved arrow patterns, there are two of those that need to happen in order to get this substitution reaction to happen, in order to replace one thing with another. The thing you have has to come off so that's loss of a leaving group. And then another thing, as a nucleophile, oops, another nucleophilic thing has to come in and attack. So you have nucleophilic attack. So in every substitution reaction, you will have these two patterns. You'll have loss of a leaving group and nucleophilic attack. If you didn't have loss of a leaving group, you would never get rid of the thing you want to, to leave. And if you didn't have nucleophilic attack, you would never replace it with anything. So those are the staples of substitution reactions. But there are two ways that you can have those staples. They could either happen together, like you see here, or they can happen separately. So to just to compare, if they were to happen separately, you could imagine having this leaving group leave. It leaves behind a carbocation. And sometimes if you stop caring about a molecule in organic chemistry, even if it's still in the container, they'll, they might write minus that molecule. above the arrow, and that just means we're not paying attention to that anymore. So now you have that carbocation and your nucleophile now can swoop in, attack it, and you get your product. So we have sort of two ways that you can do a substitution. You could do both of the two, um, the two arrow pushing patterns together or you can do them separately. First, loss of a leaving group, and then after, separately, nucleophilic attack. So those two ways of doing substitution reactions are the two big categories for them. And so they're labeled with the names for categories. They're both substitution reactions, so they both have an S for substitution, the driving force behind these ultimately is the attack of a nucleophile. So you have a nucleophile attacking in both of them, so you have this lowercase n. And in the first one, you have two things happening at the same time, loss of a leaving group and nucleophilic attack. And so there is a two there. In the second mechanism, you have only one thing ever happening at a time. First loss of a leaving group, then that's done. Second nucleophilic attack, they happen separately, only one at a time and so there's a one there. And so you have two big types of substitution reactions. You have SN2 reactions, where you do the substitution all at once, loss of a leaving group and nucleophilic attack both happen at the same time, and then you have SN1 reactions, where you only do one thing at a time, loss of a leaving group, then that's over, and then nucleophilic attack. So let's organize our thoughts about these two types of reactions uh, by looking at five different characteristics about them. And we already talked about this first one. SN2 reactions are described as being concerted. Oops, the mechanism is described as being concerted. And what that means is, just like in a concert, all of the musicians play together, in this SN2 reaction, all of the arrow pushing patterns happen together. So they both happen together, it's concerted. The SN1 reaction is described as being stepwise because it happens in steps. First step, loss of a leaving group. Second step, nucleophilic attack. 
So that's a big a big feature. It gives them their names. Second, if you think about the if you wanted to write like draw little reaction coordinate diagrams here, an SN2 reaction does not have any intermediates. You just have to destabilize this molecule enough for it to turn into the products. So you have a certain amount of energy for your reactants, destabilize it, and it turns into products. So there's only one hill in the energy diagram. But with an SN2 reaction, you do have an intermediate. You have a carbocation that exists for a little while. So you do a reaction, you get a product, but it's not very stable, so it doesn't exist for very long, and then you get the final product. So this one in the middle that didn't exist very long, that's the intermediate. And so you do the reaction, loss of a uh, leaving group, and then you have this, oops. You do the reaction, loss of a leaving group, but then you have that carbocation intermediate, and you have to destabilize that just a little bit before you get your product. And so the SN1 reaction has sort of two hills or two humps. The valley in between is your carbocation intermediate. And each of the hills represents the activation energy needed for each of the two reactions. The rate law, if you remember, we'll use the rate equation, which you would have learned in general chemistry too, but if you don't recall, it's not a big deal. It's just relating the rate to the different reagents. Now, there's always a little fud, like a fudge factor here. This lowercase k is just a conversion factor that takes care of units. But otherwise, if you think about the rate for an SN2 reaction, if you increase the concentration of the carbon chain with the leaving group, and that carbon chain with the leaving group is called the substrate. If you increase the concentration of the substrate, the reaction will happen more often because there will be more of this in the substrate and solution, so it'll knock into the nucleophile more often, and so the reaction will happen faster. So you could speed up, the first way you could speed up an SN2 reaction is by increasing the concentration of the substrate. And remember, those brackets stand for molar concentration. So increase the molar concentration of the substrate, and the rea reaction goes faster. The other thing in an SN2 reaction that would speed it up is if you increase the concentration of the nucleophile. Because if you increase the concentration of the nucleophile, then it'll bump into substrates more often, and the reaction will happen more often. So the substrate, I'm sorry, the nucleophile will also increase the rate, increase the rate of the concentration of the nucleophile, and the rate will grow faster. So an SN2 reaction depends on two things, the substrate and the nucleophile. And this is another reason why there's a 2 in the name, because the, the rate depends on two things. You, sometimes this is referred to being second order. Okay, if you think about the rate of an SN1 reaction, this happens in two steps. And the overall rate is really defined by the rate of the slowest step. The first step, loss of a leaving group, is the slowest step. And if you look at the charges, that should make sense. This molecule all by itself is pretty stable. There's no full charges there. So sure, the leaving group can come off, but it's not. there isn't as big of a push for it to come off as there is in the second step for these opposite full charges to attract. The nucleophile and the carbocation will attract much faster. That'll happen much faster than the leaving group will leave. So really, the rate is defined by the slowest step, and the slowest step is the loss of the leaving group. If this takes, whatever, 15 minutes, and this takes 10 trillionths of a second, it's really this first step that defines the rate. Now notice, in this first step, you only have the substrate. So if you increase the concentration of the substrate, sure, as it's bouncing around, there will be more leaving groups to come off, and the leaving groups will come off more often, and so that would increase the rate. If you increase the rate of the substrate, the concentration of the substrate, you increase the rate for an SN1 reaction. But notice that it doesn't matter if you increase the concentration of the nucleophile. The nucleophile is involved in the fast step. That's not what's slowing the reaction down in the first place. That's like the 10 trillionths of a second part of the reaction. If you make it happen in 1 trillionth of a second instead, and this part of the this step is still taking 15 minutes, the experience is that the reaction is still going to take 15 minutes, so it's, the rate won't be sped up. And so the rate of an SN1 reaction does not 
depend on the nucleophile. So it only depends on the substrate. So that's another difference. Now let's think about the type of thing that's getting attacked here. We talked about how, how um, carbons can be classified based on how crowded they are. You could have a carbon that is bonded to only one other carbon and the rest are hydrogens. So there's plenty of room around this molecule. And that's a primary carbon. The fact that it's only bonded to one carbon makes it primary. On the other hand, you could have a carbon that's bonded to two carbons. And in that case, this carbon here would be secondary because it would be bonded to two carbons. And that's a little more crowded. And then you could imagine having a carbon bonded to three carbons, and that would be tertiary. This carbon right here in the middle is tertiary because it's bonded to three carbons, and it's really crowded. Now the crowding makes a difference because it makes hard, it hard for other molecules to reach this carbon in the center, the more crowded it is, the more carbons it's bonded to. So let's say you're doing an SN1 reaction, and you have your nucleophile. If that is trying to attack a primary carbon, easy peasy, plenty of room there. If it's trying to attack a secondary carbon, it's a little harder. It would just have to make sure it goes to this opposite side. But if it's trying to attack a tertiary carbon, it's really hard for it to get there. It's too crowded. You might say, why doesn't it attack on the top? Here I have hydrogens, but remember in these substitution reactions, you're going to have leaving groups. And leaving groups are almost always big. That's one of the reasons why they can take electrons and leave the molecule, because they'll spread it out over their enormous size. So <clears throat> the leaving group is already big. If you have these other three carbons, it's gigantic, and the nucleophile doesn't have anywhere to attack. So it's easiest for the nucleophile to attack a primary carbon and hardest for it to attack a tertiary carbon. So SN2 reactions that depend on the nucleophile, in those cases, a leaving group on a primary carbon is the best, and a leaving group on a tertiary carbon where it's really crowded, that's the worst. The nucleophile can't attack in that case. So that's for an SN2 reaction. Compare that with an SN1 reaction. In an SN1 reaction, the leaving group leaves. That's the first step, not nucleophilic attack. The leaving group leaves, and so you end up just having a carbocation. Now, these carbocations, the carbons that have the positive charge in the middle, those have those carbons have three bonds, zero lone pairs. So these are all trigonal planar. That's the shape of every carbocation. And the fact that it's planar means it's flat. So if it's flat, the nucleophile can come in and attack any of these. It doesn't matter. These groups are only pointing to the side. It can come in the top, like on top of a pancake, and attack the carbon. Or it can go in the bottom, like on the bottom of a pancake, and attack the carbon. The, the, the groups aren't able to crowd it out. So in SN1 reactions, because the first step is loss of a leaving group, you don't have to worry about crowding. And so the the intermediate you form is just dependent on the stability of the carbocation. Carbo and as we saw in chapter 6, carbocations are more stable the more substituted they are because they can pull electron density from the carbons. Carbon has um, six electrons around it, so it can borrow that. Hydrogen only has one, so it's not able to donate as much electron density, whereas the carbons can, and that stabilizes the positive charge. So the, a tertiary carbocation is the most stable, and if the leaving group is on the uh, tertiary carbon, then you'll get a tertiary carbocation, and that favors this SN1 reaction. Oops, that favors this SN1 reaction.
because you form the most stable carbocation. So actually, the leaving group on a tertiary carbocation, or, or leaving group on a tertiary carbon, is the best for SN1, because that'll give you a tertiary carbocation, which will be the most stable. It'll stabilize that carbocation. On the other hand, if the leaving group was on a, ter a primary carbon, then you get a primary carbocation, which is really unstable. And so it's really hard to form that. So the leaving, if the leaving group is on a primary carbon, that's the worst case scenario for an SN1 reaction because it forms the least stable carbocation intermediate. Okay, one other feature to think about with these SN1 reactions before we dive into the exercises, and that's the stereochemistry. We were talking before about what, what happens if the substrate is a chiral center. So what happens if your leaving group is on a chiral center? What happens then? Well, we saw how these leaving groups are really, really big. Oops, let me put it like this. The leaving groups are really, really large. That's what makes them great leaving groups. Chlorine is the size of a methyl group, CH3, all those four atoms, or those four atoms together. One atom, chlorine, is the size of those all together. Bromine is even bigger, and iodine is even bigger than that. So these are really enormous atoms, and that's why they're able to act as leaving groups in the first place. They can pop off of that molecule, take the negative charge, and spread it out, dilute it over an enormous space. So those are really big atoms, and that means that a nucleophile that's coming in, if the leaving group is still there, it's not going to be able to attack on that side. If it, if it tries to get to this carbon on the side that the leaving group is on, it'll, it won't be able to find an opening. It'll just get pushed away. So it, it always attacks on the opposite side of the leaving group. Now this is for an SN2 reaction, because an SN2 reaction is the only one where the nucleophile and the leaving group, the nucleophile attacks at the same time as the leaving group. So it always attacks on the opposite side, and so you always get what's called inversion of configuration. If the bromine was coming out, then the nucleophile had to attack on the opposite thing. It would have to attack going away, on the side that's going away from us. So if you have a chiral center and you do an SN2 reaction, if something was R, it becomes S. You get inversion of configuration. The nucleophile always attacks on the opposite side of the leaving group in an SN2 reaction. Compare that with what happens in an SN1 reaction. In an SN1 reaction, the first step is loss of a leaving group. So let's say you have your chiral center. Leaving group leaves. And what you're left with is a carbocation. And as we saw, all carbocations are trigonal planar. The carbons have three bonds and zero lone pairs. And the shape they get is trigonal planar, so it's flat. So when the nucleophile swoops in, it could attack either on the top or on the bottom of this flat pancake. And so you end up getting both possible chiral centers, both enantiomers. You get the enantiomer where it attacked on the top, so it's coming out at us. But you also get the enantiomer where it attacked on the bottom, so it's going away from us. In other words, you get a 50-50 mixture of the two enantiomers. And that mixture is called a racemic mixture. So in the case of SN1 reactions, if you have a chiral center, you end up getting a racemic mixture of two products.
It's a 50-50 mixture of the two enantiomers. So these are the different, so uh, we started out just talking about what a substitution reaction was, replacing one group on a carbon chain with another. We saw there are two types. We saw that in all substitution reactions, you have loss of leaving group and nucleophilic attack. And there are two ways you can have that. You could have those happen together, that's an SN2 reaction, or you could have them happen separately. That's an SN1 reaction. And we went through these five different features of these two reactions. So this video was meant to give an explanation for this table. In future exercises, we're just gonna use this table without going into as much depth about the reasons behind what, we, what is on here. And that's because we went through those explanations 